Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Robert McKenna. He is Senior Lecturer in Philosophy at the University of Liverpool. And today we're talking about his book, Non-Ideal Epistemology. So, Robin, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Yeah, nice to be here. So I noticed that you've actually covered this confusion in your intro, uh, Ricardo. You call me Robert first and then Robin. This is a constant problem. So my <laughs> official legal name is Robert, um, but everyone calls me Robin. I publish under Robin, but my university uh, refuses to call me Robin. I have to be Robert in all the official systems. So yeah, as I said, endless cause of confusion um, throughout my entire <laughs> life. <laughs> Okay, so let's get into it then. So we're talking about epistemology today and particularly about non-ideal epistemology, but I guess that before we get into what non-ideal epistemology is, we should talk a little bit more broadly about what epistemologists usually do and what ideal theory, the opposite of non-ideal, really is. So let's start with that. What kinds of what are the the most common approaches in epistemology? Then, how do epistemologists usually approach questions? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I know that if you go online, you find all sorts of kind of nice, simple definitions of epistemology. Like, for example, it's the theory of knowledge, or or the ethics of belief uh, or something like that. But the thing that really impresses me as someone who works in epistemology is that epistemologists do lots of different things and they ask lots of different kinds of questions. So some epistemologists ask what you might call like what is questions, like what is knowledge, what is evidence, what is justified belief. Um, a lot of the time to answer them, they kind of do conceptual analysis, the, the kind of traditional method of philosophy, uh, if you like, but you don't have to do that. You can answer those questions using uh, different kinds of methods. Um, those aren't the kinds, kinds of questions I'm particularly interested in, uh, at least in the book anyway, perhaps. Uh, other, in other moods I'm interested in them, but not in the book. I'm more interested in uh, kind of broadly normative questions um, about knowledge, but also about belief. Questions such as um, how should I go about forming belief, uh, but also questions like how should I go about gathering evidence? I guess most broadly, uh, how should I go about conducting my inquiries? And then I couple that, as many other epistemologists do, with an interest in uh, kind of social dimensions of inquiry. So most inquiries are not just you by yourself, it's you with your friends or your colleagues. You're getting information from a wide range of sources. Um, so the question isn't so much how should I inquire, it's rather how should we inquire uh, together. Um, so those are the sorts of epistemological questions that I'm interested in, these sort of social questions about um, how to conduct inquiries. So you asked about ideal theory in epistemology and, and what right. that is. So one reason why I like putting it in terms of these broad normative questions is that you can then distinguish between two different kinds of approach uh, to them. So mm -hmm. one kind of approach, and this is the ideal theory approach, uh, I would say, is you sort of, I don't know, this is maybe a bit of a caricature, but it's not too much of a caricature. You kind of sit there and you think, well, what would a really good inquiry look like? What sorts of things would our good inquirers do? Um, how would they go about gathering information on the assumption that lots of the information that's out there is kind of good quality? How would they share information on the assumption that they're not going to be lying to each other all the time? Um, so you're kind of answering these normative questions about inquiry, communal inquiry, in a way that's in a kind of obvious sense idealized. Um, if you like, you're kind of constructing a model of what a kind of idealized community of inquirers uh, would look like. And when you start to talk about norms of inquiry, these are things that your idealized inquirers would do. The idea then being that, you know, we're not idealized inquirers, we've got all sorts of imperfections, but what we should do is, if you like, try to emulate this idealized community of inquirers. And I guess the better the job we do of emulating that idealized community, the, the better we're doing. So that's the ideal theory approach. Mm -hmm. That's not, as the title of uh, my book suggests, that's not the approach I favor. I favor the, the non-ideal approach, where instead of constructing this idealized model, we look at actual inquiries. Uh, so here, of course, scientific inquiries are a natural place to look. We want to look at how actual inquiries work. 
We want to identify the actual inquiries that seem to be getting something right. Uh, they seem to be productive across a few different dimensions. And then we try to figure out, well, what exactly is it about those inquiries that enable them to work? What are they doing? It could be that, as it turns out, what our actual inquirers uh, do in these well-functioning inquiries is quite different from what the uh, idealized inquirers do. So, for example, and many people have this view, it might turn out that a degree of dogmatism and closed-mindedness is actually a kind of essential ingredient of successful scientific inquiry. Obviously, you want to be limits on this, but it uh, may well be the case that um, good scientific inquirers are rather more dogmatic than um, the more idealized versions uh, would be. And that's just one example, but that's kind of basic idea. You can, if you look at how things actually work, and from that you try to uh, get a sense of what sorts of things we we should do, given the the limitations of the situations in which we find ourselves. This is actually very interesting because I mean, shouldn't all epistemology from the very beginning be non-ideal in the sense that it should realistically look at how actual people uh, approach questions in epistemology, how actual people work cognitively and so on. Be because, I mean, isn't it a, a bit, um, I, I don't know, I don't even know the exact word to use here, but idealizing something and expecting people to work in a particular idealized way, isn't it, isn't it a, a little bit... Uh, unrealistic well obviously i'm sympathetic to what i think is behind the question um but i guess maybe what i should say is that um how to put this the point of my book and um the kind of criticism i want to make of what i was earlier calling ideal theory uh, yeah. is not that there are no conceivable reasons for which you might adopt this sort of approach. So for example, one very popular subfield in contemporary epistemology is formal epistemology. So what formal epistemologists are doing essentially is they're uh, constructing very idealized models of inquirers. These inquirers have got properties such as log logical omniscience. Um, so they, can, they see all the logical consequences of their beliefs and they endorse those consequences. Obviously people aren't like that. Um, now, you might think, why would you do this? Uh, as you put it, this is very unrealistic. But as it turns out, um, formal epistemology has been influential in a wide range of fields outside of philosophy. So it seems that uh, non-philosophers are very much interested in the sorts of work that formal epistemologists do. I mean, one way of thinking about this perhaps would be, you know, fields like... Um, artificial intelligence and robotics, you're trying to construct uh, agents, you have to kind of give them rules for how to go about doing things. Uh, it seems like here you might be uh, actually interested in trying to uh, figure out what would be uh, good rules uh, for someone to to try and follow. Um, I'm not sure that, if that's the best example of what I have in mind, but hopefully the, the audience uh, gets the idea. Um, this sort of formal work, even though it's not realistic as a model of human beings, um, well, it's not meant to be. That's not what it is. It's not trying to be a model of human beings. It's, it's doing something else. Kind of roughly an analogous, I guess, to the way in which um, things like logic, right? So logic isn't meant to be a model of how human beings uh, reason. Um, if you take it that way, it's very it's a very bad model, but that's not what logic is. Um, and logic, of course, has got all sorts of very important practical um, uses. Um, so the critique of ideal theory in epistemology is not that uh, it has no uh, point. The critique is rather more precise than that. Um, roughly speaking, the critique is epistemologists increasingly are turning their attention to real world problems, often real world political problems, but sometimes just more broadly social problems. And they want to use the tools of epistemology to say something about those problems. Um, in some cases, one gets the impression they think that we can use the tools of epistemology to actually put forward um, sensible solutions to these problems. That's where this tendency towards idealization becomes a problem. Because now you're addressing an actual problem faced by actual human beings. But if you're using these tools that embed all sorts of idealized assumptions, then it's not uh, particularly uh, surprising if it turns out that, that those solutions aren't really particularly fitting to the actual problems.
people face. Um, and part of the reason you, you might think, well, why would anyone do this, right? Like, why would anyone get confused and think that um, these idealized models have got um, practical application? Well, part of the reason for this is that the way we put it earlier was that ideal theory and non-ideal theory are kind of two diametrically opposed things. But that's not quite right, of course. So you can have uh, think about it as kind of a continuum, right? So at one end, you've got the most idealized ideal theory. At the other end, like the least idealized, the most non-ideal theory. Um, like actual epistemologists with actual views will be located somewhere along this continuum. Um, I would say that kind of the, the dominant trend in uh, my kind of epistemology, analytic epistemology, is more towards the idealized side. But there is a recognition of uh, certain human limitations. And the, the critique in the book is that the problem becomes once you start to recognize certain limitations, you can kind of lose track of the fact that actually you're ignoring other limitations. Um, so you end up kind of, in a sense, confused about just how ideal your approach is. Um, it is less than fully ideal, perhaps, but um, it is idealized in ways that cause problems, given the sorts of uses to which you want to put your theory. Hopefully that wasn't too cryptic. No, no, not at all. Uh, thank you for that clarification. And related to a point that you made there, in the book you talk about non-ideal epistemology as being explicitly ethical and political. Could you explain that point? What does yeah. it mean exactly? Um, I'm trying to think what exactly you're picking up on in the book. Um, well, there's, there's, there's a clear sense in which non-ideal epistemology is explicitly ethical and political, which is that I think that once you are approaching things in this non-ideal way, um, it's very difficult to um, put down a kind of clear distinction between epistemological and, say, ethical or political questions. Um, mm -hmm. But if you work at a higher level of abstraction, you can sort of try and preserve this this, this nice, uh, neat distinction. Um, so that's one way in which I think um, it's explicitly ethical and political. So one topic I discuss in the book, for example, is um, uh, science denial, uh, in particular, climate change uh, denial. Um, so I'm interested in the epistemology of science denial. So this is, as I see it, an inquiry in epistemology. But of course, this has got a political dimension because I'm talking about climate change uh, skepticism and that's connected up with all these big political questions. So there's just, as I see it, no way of doing the epistemology of science denial that is not uh, also to do some kind of ethics or political philosophy. Um, so perhaps that's what uh, I had in mind in the, the passage you're, you're referring to. Uh, and also you're interested in feminist epistemology and it's also something that you talk about in the book. And so how does non-ideal epistemology relate to feminist epistemology? Good, yeah. So I guess actually that gives me an opportunity to expand on what I said in response to your previous question about non-ideal epistemology as explicitly ethical and political. So one way of characterizing feminist epistemology is that it is an approach to recognizably epistemological questions, so questions about knowledge, the nature of knowledge, for example, that is informed by feminist concerns. And of course, feminist concerns are ethical and political uh, concerns. Uh, but it's still an approach to epistemology. So um, a feminist epistemologist, for example, is still interested in um, a question such as how we should go about forming beliefs or a question such as how we should go about conducting inquiries. But they see that question as, um, as relevant to their uh, feminist uh, political concerns. So for example, when a feminist epistemologist takes a look at science, they might ask questions such as, well, why is it that so much scientific inquiry seems to ignore questions of gender? Why is it that it seems like when you look at certain fields, such as evolutionary um, psychology, there are certain assumptions about male dominance that um, seem to be unquestioned within the field. Uh, perhaps we should question those assumptions. Um, so feminist epistemologists are asking epistemological questions, but with these kind of political and ethical concerns in the background. So to, now to go back to your, your question, Ricardo, about uh, how this all relates to non-ideal epistemology. So mm -hmm. the way in which I put it in the book, and I guess I, I stand by this, is that 
feminist epistemology is uh, a kind of non-ideal epistemology. So feminist epistemologists are doing non-ideal epistemology. Uh, I think they've done some of the best non-ideal epistemology, which is why I draw on feminist epistemology so much uh, in the book. Um, but you can do non-ideal epistemology without having these sorts of uh, feminist concerns uh, in the foreground, uh, so to speak. So that's not to say you're doing kind of anti-feminist epistemology, it's just that that's maybe not the, the sorts of um, considerations you are focusing on. So for example, to go back to the earlier example, perhaps you could bring a kind of feminist dimension to your analysis of science denial, um, but that's kind of optional, uh, as it were. Um, you might be thinking about a phenomenon such as uh, science denial uh, in just a different way. Um, as I said earlier in the book, I'm doing something like the epistemology of science denial, and that just doesn't seem to me to be a kind of feminist epistemology. Um, so yeah, that would mean non-ideal epistemology is if you like kind of a broader category than feminist epistemology. Uh, so feminist epistemology would be a kind of species of, of non-ideal epistemology, perhaps a particularly interesting species, uh, but still uh, just a species. Then there's kind of other ways of doing non-ideal epistemology that wouldn't be obviously feminist. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but I guess that some of the things that you mentioned there regarding feminist epistemology apply more broadly to uh, non-ideal epistemology. And as you said, feminist epistemology, you look at it as a form of non-ideal epistemology, but in the sense that for uh, it looks at epistemic agents as situated in a particular social, cultural, perhaps political environment, right? For example, you mentioned the fact that feminist, uh, feminist epistemologists sometimes look at scientific inquiry in certain disciplines, and for example, they notice that scientists many times come to the table, come to the table with certain. Uh, assumptions that then drive the way they produce science or the way they formulate hypotheses to be tested. For example, certain assumptions about uh, sex or gender differences and where they come from. And then that has an, an impact on the production of science, how they evaluate evidence and so on. So is that uh, right? I mean, am I right in pointing that out? Or yes, certainly. So, so on the official sort of uh, account in the book, non-ideal epistemology means an approach to these normative questions I was uh, mentioning earlier that involves several different dimensions of uh, non-ideality, uh, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of those dimensions is a recognition of the extent to which actual inquirers are socially situated. Um, so that means that they've got the various markers of social identity, right? So they've got a, a gender, a... a a race, a class, and so on. But then obviously a whole bunch of other things besides, right? So they've got a, a job, a scientist, for example. Um, they're embedded within a particular community, which has implications for the sorts of information sources they have available. All these sorts of things have to be taken into account. Um, so kind of one nice way of putting the sense in which feminist epistemology is almost by definition a version of non-ideal epistemology is precisely that in feminist epistemology, uh, it's kind of definitional that it is based on a recognition of the uh, social situatedness of, of knowers. And in particular, the fact that uh, everyone has got uh, uh, a gender um, identity and that kind of informs the way in which they they might look at the world in all sorts of ways not necessarily in a kind of crude way you know the idea is not there's like a, a male way of looking at the world and a female way of looking at the world that's uh, I mean, you can find that idea in older writings in feminist epistemology but that's not the, the more modern idea the more modern idea is just the kind of to me obvious fact that who you are has an implication has implications sorry for for how you look at the world and therefore is something that uh can't be ignored if you are asking uh, certain epistemological questions. I mean, to me, it just seems obviously true. So, so to that sense, I, in that sense, I can't really see why you you would disagree with the basic idea behind um, feminist epistemology. So let's get into some specific issues, problems that you deal with in the book related to non-ideal 
epistemology and uh, how they play out in non-ideal epistemology. So uh, one of the issues you address there is the problem of the identification of expertise. So what is this problem and how would it play out in non-ideal epistemology? Yeah, good. So this is an interesting problem because it's, in well, interesting because it's, it's an interesting problem, both both as a theoretical problem and also as a kind of like more practical or applied problem. So the theoretical problem is just that um, unless we assume that all experts agree about everything, there are always going to be situations where different experts say different things. So, for example, uh, one person says that the um, a good diet is one that is high in protein. Another expert says that a good diet is one that is uh, high in fat, for example. So two medical uh, experts saying different things. Um, so then the question becomes, well, how are you, as someone who is not an expert in the relevant uh, subject, in this case, uh, nutrition, how are you meant to um, decide who to listen to? And you can uh, formulate this as a kind of abstract philosophical problem. You can say lots of interesting things about it. Um, so the work you can kind of do on this as an abstract problem, I think, is independently um, worth worth doing. Um, that said, I'm not really interested in that abstract problem. I'm interested in, if you like, kind of the form that abstract problem takes in, in actual uh, environments, where it's not that you're kind of sitting there as a, a uninformed layperson without any kind of inclination towards one side rather than the other. No, often you've got an inclination towards one side. So for example, um, I don't know, you've been brought up uh, being told that um, uh, fatty foods are bad for you. Uh, so when you come, kind of come across this sort of disagreement between these two experts, your inclinations automatically side with the, the doctor who is saying that um, you should avoid fat. Um, but of course, you know, that should lead you to kind of interrogate your um, prior inclinations. Um, you might want to ask, where do they come from? Uh, am I terribly well informed? Perhaps I've been misinformed. Um, so that just makes the problem even more difficult because um, it's not just that from a kind of abstract rational perspective, it's not obvious how you should decide the uh, the issue. Um, you've also got to reckon with the fact that, you know, you're not impartial, you're not an impartial observer. And um, but then how do you go about questioning your kind of inclinations towards one side rather than the other? It doesn't really seem obvious how you go about doing that. Um, and that to me seems like a kind of difficult problem. So of course, the example I've, I've given perhaps isn't the most, uh, isn't the best one for making the political dimensions of the problem salient. So just replace this with a different example. Um, You've got one doctor saying that uh, wearing masks uh, is going to protect you against, uh, let's imagine, a brand new pandemic, so not COVID, but uh, a new one in 10 years' time. Uh, another doctor saying that they won't. Um, you've got inclinations one way or the other. Perhaps you uh, think, you know, masking is uh, is fine, or perhaps you you think it's it's not it's not so good. Uh, that's going to colour how you um, interpret this expert disagreement. But of course, you know, you should be kind of questioning uh, the interpretation that you give. To the disagreement and that just lend, leaves you i would say in a, in a very difficult situation and so i guess that at least to some extent associated with that uh, there's also uh, the idea of intellectual autonomy and the, uh, the reason why i'm bringing that up now is that Many times, uh, I mean, relying on experts, people pit it against intellectual autonomy, against the idea of, to put it in simpler terms, uh, thinking for yourself instead of relying on the intellectual or the epistemic work of others, in this case, experts. So to what extent should we have it, according to this non-ideal epistemological yeah. approach? Yeah. Um... So, the, so there's a view I think probably I defend in the book that I now have come to think is a little bit too strong. So what I'll do is I'll say what the view was in the book and then maybe explain why now I think it's a little bit too strong, although okay. in its essentials I think it's still right. So the view in the book I think, or at least one could justifiably get the impression from the book, from the book that I think that um, intellectual autonomy uh, would be nice, but we uh, can't really have it. And insofar as we can try to have it, it's often going to make things worse. 
So what do I mean by that? Uh, well, let's go back to my example where you are trying to decide between, I don't know, the pro-masking doctor and the, the anti-masking doctor. Um, so someone who wants to kind of focus on the importance of intellectual autonomy is going to say, well, sure, you're going to end up in this very difficult situation where you almost have to kind of question your assumptions before you can start to decide uh, which of the people to listen to. Um, but still, you should try and do that, right? So you should try and sort through the issue for yourself. Perhaps you should go and read a bunch of um, uh, medical literature. Um, you should talk to people. You should really try to uh, come to your own view uh, about the, the matter in question. Um, so that's what the defender of intellectual autonomy would say. In the book, what I essentially say is that um, that's not going to work out very well. Um, essentially because I think that, um, this is going back to what I said earlier, there's just no good way for you to remove your prior biases from whatever process of inquiry you try to carry out. So the fact that, for example, you've got inclinations uh, in favour of masks is inevitably going to lead you to perform a sort of biased literature review, and the chances are you'll end up just uh, gathering evidence that supports your, um, your initial View of the situation and the claim is not that you'll do that consciously right the claim is that you're in a sense sort of kind of fool yourself into thinking that you're doing an unbiased search uh, whereas in fact you're doing a biased search the kind of idea i have in the book is that what this shows you is that at best trying to be intellectually autonomous is is useless at worst actually it's going to uh, lead you further away from the truth because uh, what you could do instead is rather than trying to uh, figure out the matter for yourself is you could, well, you could, it's not so much that you could do something, it's rather that uh, a better environment could be constructed for you uh, in which um, there's less need for you to, uh, to do uh, these things by yourself. So the idea in the book is really that um, left to our own devices, perhaps we'll try to be intellectually autonomous, that won't work, work out very well. So really what would be required is a, an attempt to engineer a situation where people don't uh, need to be, um, well, people end up with the right sorts of views um, uh, irrespective of, of what they do as individual inquirers. If that sounds a little bit uh, possibly Orwellian, we can talk about that later. Anyway, so the, the, the kind of shift in my thinking that uh, I've kind of uh, come to more recently is perhaps that is a little bit overstated. I think probably there are going to be a wide range of important cases where uh, trying to be intellectually autonomous uh, could actually um, be to your benefit, perhaps in certain situations. For example, in situations where there's a kind of problem at the level of um, expertise, perhaps the experts themselves are subject to a kind of groupthink. Um, there could be value in uh, a kind of intellectual autonomy. Uh, but the point I wanted to make in the book was really independent of all this. The point was more just that um, we shouldn't be led into the following mistake, um, just because uh, it would be good for an idealized inquirer to strive to be intellectually autonomous doesn't mean that we should strive to be intellectually autonomous because an idealized inquirer is going to lack the sorts of uh, features such as uh, susceptibility towards various forms of bias that mean that when we try to be intellectually autonomous, we end up making a mess of it. So mm -hmm. the point is, if you like, kind of more almost conceptual. Um, it's kind of natural if you have this kind of ideal theory way of thinking to um, to think that intellectually autonomous intellectual autonomy is important because it would be important for an idealized inquirer. But again, we're we're not idealized inquirers, um, so the argument isn't that simple. What you'd have to do is show that uh, for actual inquirers in the actual situations that inquirers find themselves uh, trying to be intellectually autonomous uh, works out well for them. Um, so perhaps now I think that that will happen uh, more often than I give the impression I do in the book. Um, but the point is still that's what you would have to show. Hopefully that answer one... made sense. That was quite... No, no, no. Of course, I, I just want to ask you one or two follow-ups to it. Yep. So at a certain point there, you mentioned the idea or touched on the idea of constructing a better epistemic environment. But yes. I, I would like to understand a little bit better... Uh, if we are operating under this non-ideal epistemological framework, what does it mean then to have a better epistemic environment? What does it entail exactly? Right, yeah. So, I mean, let me put it in a kind of abstract uh, 
terms first and hopefully that will help your mm -hmm. your audience get the idea so let's imagine the the best of all uh possible epistemic worlds as it were so this is a world where there is plentiful uh, information to hand and that is genuine information so we can even imagine there's no misinformation out there, right? So that all the information that you get from all the sources that there are in this uh, perfect world are giving out good, genuine information. So someone who lives in that world is going to have a very easy time forming true beliefs, right? They just literally pick up the first thing they come across and that will give them a bunch of true beliefs. Now, perhaps those aren't the true beliefs they want. Perhaps this is true beliefs about the nutritional properties of some new food stuff and they don't really care about that. Perhaps they want to know about, perhaps okay. they want to know, perhaps they want to know about how uh, nuclear energy works, for example. Um, mm -hmm. So they don't really care about uh, nutrition. Uh, but the point is still stands that what they're going to get from just picking up this bit of paper is lots of genuine information. So of course we don't live in that world, uh, right? So that's mm -hmm. not what our world's like. There's um, even if you disagree with the uh, authorities about what is misinformation, you're still going to agree that there's lots of misinformation out there. It's just you might think that what many regard as uh, misinformation is is inaccurately labeled as such. Everyone's going to agree that there's lots of misinformation uh, out there. So that makes it hard for us to form true beliefs um, and. This is the point I made earlier. It's especially hard given that you know we're not unbiased observers uh, of of this situation. We've got inclinations one way or the other, and that's going to lead us to essentially uh, focus on the um, bits of information that uh, support our uh, our prior views. So constructing a better epistemic environment, um, kind of very abstractly, means making our world more like this perfect world. Uh, that's that, that's what it would mean. So, of course, there's all sorts of enormous uh, political questions about how exactly you would go about doing that. I think in a wide range of, of cases you might want to discuss, this becomes very difficult because obviously there's not going to be background agreement on what is true in the first place. And if there's not background agreement on what is true, there'll be disagreement on what exactly making the environment better involves. And that's perhaps one reason why I focus so much on climate change as an example in the book, because, you know, obviously there is some disagreement, but there really is very widespread disagreement amongst um, all the relevant authorities that at the very least, climate change is real and is driven by human behavior. There's disagreement about what to do about that fact, um, even at the kind of the level of the relevant experts, um, not so much about the, the fact that this is a, a human uh, driven uh, phenomenon. So that to me kind of gives me a kind of workable example of what constructing a better environment would involve in the case of beliefs about climate change. It would involve uh, making it easier, essentially, for people to access uh, good, genuine information about the climate and uh, harder for them to access uh, misinformation. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't necessarily mean censorship, just, just to add. Uh, that might mean, for example, and this is actually what the focus is on in the book, getting science communicators uh, to think more, to think carefully about how exactly they go about trying to get their message across. Um, so this is not about um, uh, censoring uh, the voices of skeptics, rather it's about getting people that want to put across the, the pro-science message to think about how to do that effectively. Um, so that's not a point about censorship or anything of that sort. That's more about, you know, how can you go about uh, convincing people of these things that you, that you think are obviously true? And um, essentially in the book, that's what I focus on uh, so far as constructing a better environment uh, is concerned. I hope that I answers think, the question. Yes, I think that you've already answered this next question, at least partly, but uh, just to address it directly now, uh, one of the issues that stems, I guess, from the fact that we live in this sort of imperfect epistemic environment is or has to do with public ignorance about important political and scientific issues. So how would you deal with that then? Yeah, so I think probably this is another place where my thinking has moved on a little bit uh, from what I say in the book. Uh, okay. Not in the sense that I disagree with anything I say in the book, maybe just in the sense that I would want to add uh, something uh, to it. Um, so I think the way to think about public ignorance of important uh, scientific issues as a kind of political problem is to adopt a sort of, if you like, pluralistic response to it. So what you want to do essentially is um, 
improve the situation. So uh, abstractly speaking, uh, create a, an environment where people have more true beliefs about the relevant issues. And of course, there are various tools one could use in order to, to go about doing that. People often want to talk about education. So in this case, we're talking about science education. They also want to talk about uh, public communication strategies. So here we're talking about science communication strategies. And then they want to start to talk, you know, kind of more fine grained about, well, what exactly should these strategies look like? So, so for example, in the education context, how should we teach science? Uh, should we teach it as kind of a body of established facts that one can't question? Should we do something a bit different? Um, if we do something a bit different, what, what should that be? In the science communication context, you know, so like, should we, um, again, should we kind of focus single-mindedly on getting our message across, or rather should we try to acknowledge certain kinds of complexities, trusting people to, to make up their own minds? Um, so in the book, I think probably I adopt a slightly more myopic approach than I would now. So I kind of, I probably I give the impression that um, Roughly speaking, it's going to be difficult um, to make a kind of um, balanced case for certain scientific issues. So you should focus more on thinking about how you frame your message uh, in the hope that that will um, make it easier for that message to get acceptance. So that's kind of going along the lines of maybe not trusting the public quite as much as you might uh, in order to um, make sense of things. I think now probably that's a, I would say that's a bit one-sided. Perhaps in certain situations, um, actually fuller explanations are called for. Uh, I now increasingly think that uh, the pandemic is a case in point here. So I think at least certain bodies did try to adopt this sort of information strategy where it was all very focused on getting people to have the right beliefs. There wasn't perhaps uh, enough recognition of certain kinds of nuance and complexity. Perhaps it's counterfactual, but it's plausible to me that if there had been more recognition of certain kinds of complexities, that might have actually improved uh, public uptake of certain uh, health uh, messages. Again, that's speculation, but to me, it doesn't seem uh, crazy to think that. Uh, so yeah, so um, to kind of summarize all that, uh, public ignorance about uh, science is, is a complicated issue, and I think it calls for a sort of multi-pronged ap approach. Um, but I guess the point I want to make, and this is one of the main points in the book, is that if you're approaching this as, as a problem, your approach has to be, as I put it in the book, evidence-based. Um, so the question is not uh, what might work, the question is rather, based on the evidence that we have at our disposal, um, what does seem to work? Um, and those are the sorts of, of strategies that you should uh, focus on. And of course, that kind of goes against the ways in which philosophers have tended to approach these questions, where not always, and certainly not nowadays, whether other uh, philosophers doing what I do, but, you know, at least in the recent past, the way that philosophers would approach this problem would be more akin to, to armchair speculation, to put it slightly provocatively. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Uh, so according to this non-ideal epistemology framework, what should be our obligations and responsibilities as inquirers or epistemic agents? Yeah, good. So there's a nice simple answer to this question, uh, which is that uh, you can't answer it uh, in the abstract. So, so one of the points I want to make in the book is that um, it's a mistake to think, as I think many epistemologists seem to think, that one can actually talk about our epistemic responsibilities or obligations in general. Uh, rather, the right view to me seems to be that um, what your responsibilities and obligations actually are, are going to depend on certain facts about you. Um, so, for example, it might depend on the sort of inquiry uh, you're uh, engaged in. Um, so think about uh, different kinds of scientific inquiries, for example. Um, certain scientific inquiries uh, call for a certain kind of evidence, right? So perhaps you're uh, doing the sort of inquiry that calls for randomized control trials. Well, then, you're, you know, one of your responsibilities is to conduct these randomized controlled trials, right? So kind of other sorts of evidence you, you might have are not really going to be um, germane to your inquiry. Um, so, so yeah, so as, as I said, it's not the sort of question that I, I think, uh, on my view, you can really answer uh, in general. Rather, what you need to do is you need to uh, think uh, through the different kinds of uh, responsibilities you might have in different situations.
Uh, okay, so a more specific question then. Uh, do those situations include your social situation? Does that also matter? Well, indeed, yes. Okay, so let, let me just take a step back here and kind of talk a little bit about why you might think that it's important to engage with uh, challenges to your beliefs. So mm -hmm. this is an idea that um, is often dated back to, to John Stuart Mill and uh, his uh, various uh, discussions in On Liberty of the importance of, of freedom of expression. And what I think that's really interesting when you read Mill is it's quite clear that he's not just saying that it's important that people are allowed to uh, air uh, unorthodox views. I mean, he thinks that, but he also thinks that um, it's important that we listen to them and we take them seriously, that we engage with them. So his whole argument essentially is that it is only by engaging with those who disagree with us that we, uh, if you like, earn the right to to our uh, beliefs. Uh, so the kind of thought would be that if you can't um, deal with uh, these unorthodox views, there's a sense in which um, you're not really justified. In, in having uh, your belief. Uh, it might even become what Mill called uh, a dead dogma. So to me, this is kind of an interesting uh, perspective because it seems obvious that there is something to it, right? So this is I think, one reason why uh, Mill's uh, thought has been so influential uh, even uh, hundreds of years, uh, well, just over 100 years uh, later. Um, so there's definitely something to this. Uh, and I think kind of the obvious thing to say in response to Mill, and in a way I'm saying the obvious thing, is just that, well, this kind of goes too far, right? So the fact that in certain situations, it seems clear that it, it would indeed uh, be important to deal with this uh, challenge to your beliefs does not mean that um, you always should do so. So kind of following Mill, I think I would suggest we should think about this in terms of the, the consequences or likely consequences of engagement. So Mill presumably is imagining a situation where the, the consequence of engagement is, I guess, either a recognition that you were wrong in the first place, which is good, or a kind of uh, better understanding of why you're right in the first place, which is also good. So for Mill, it's, it's, it's good either way. Um, so the point to make here is just that, well, that's not always uh, what's going to happen. Um, there are some situations where what's going to happen is you end up in kind of like a muddle, like you're not really sure uh, what to think. Um, there'll be some situations where um, you end up mistakenly concluding that you were wrong when in fact you were right. Um, and perhaps there'll be situations where you have to kind of focus a little bit more on the public consequences of having the debate. So it could be that one of the bad consequences of, of having the debate is it uh, lead, misleads uh, people uh, in your audience. So that's kind of, you know, programmatically various ways in which um, the sort of engagement uh, Mill was championing can, can actually have adverse uh, consequences. So, of course, you know, if you wanted to defend, to defend Mill here, presumably you'd say something like this, that, well, Mill wasn't claiming that in every single instance uh, you would have beneficial engagement. Rather, he's claiming that as a kind of general rule, um, you would have beneficial engagement. But I think, you know, we can go further here and say that, well, you know, that's not quite right either, because there are certain kinds of situations where I think we can say, as a general rule, engagement is not going to be beneficial. So one kind of situation is one where this is a debate that we've had many times before, uh, right? So one reason why it's not obvious what is gained by debating, for example, to take the usual example, Holocaust deniers, is that this debate has, has happened, right? There's a huge amount of scholarly, scholarly literature uh, documenting that the Holocaust happened. Um, so to have a debate about it now uh, seems somewhat uh, irrelevant because you can just point to that literature. So the debate happened. Uh, that's why there is this huge literature uh, and there's no need to go into it again. And so in that one, specific, one... Uh, let me just ask you, in that specific example, do you think that perhaps one of the things people could worry about is that if we uh, keep on uh, having that debate, it could legitimate uh, the question? I mean, it could legitimate the conspiracy theory in that specific... Well, you mean, well indeed, yes. This is, this is, what, this is what, why I said earlier that one thing that can happen it, as a consequence of having a debate is, uh, as you put it, uh, legitimation of mm -hmm. um, the, the other side uh, of that debate. Um, but just kind of getting away from the Holocaust example, which I just used, I think, because it was such an obvious example uh, to make my point. Here's a slightly less obvious example, perhaps. So I think we can say, as a kind of, maybe not entirely general rule, but a rough and ready rule, um, different people get 
different uh, or experience, um, sorry, uh, we can say as a kind of rough and ready rule that um, the consequences of engaging in a debate uh, are going to vary depending on who you are. So, for example, if you are a, a well-spoken, well-credentialed academic um, and you engage in a debate with someone, then the chances are people are going to be very impressed with, with your arguments. Um, perhaps you're going to even impress yourself. There's very little chance that uh, in engaging with uh, all sorts of opponents in debate, you end up kind of um, misleading yourself into thinking that you're wrong in the first place. Actually, what's more likely to happen is that you will end up congratulating yourself on how, how right you were all along. Things are, are different if you are someone who is along all sorts of dimensions uh, less secure. Um, perhaps you've got genuine doubts uh, in your own position. Engaging with uh, all sorts of unorthodox uh, challengers uh, could uh, solidify those doubts. Uh, and that's a problem in situations where uh, perhaps um, you're wrong to have those doubts. Uh, you know, it's kind of you're, you're doubting that you're right, but actually you, you very much are right. So one example in the book that I I use to make this point is uh, someone in a workplace situation who uh, thinks that they've faced um, uh, discrimination uh, because of their uh, gender. Um, mm -hmm. So they they think this because you know they they they, they think they're kind of fairly uh, good at picking up on these sorts of social cues. So they think that they've definitely faced discrimination, but they have the natural sorts of doubts that someone in that situation might have. One consequence for this person of kind of taking seriously all the, the men who line up to uh, dispute her interpretation of the situation is that she might end up thinking, oh, she, she actually was wrong. But of course, in many situations, she was right. Um, so these sorts of debates can knock your confidence in a way that, um, means that you you no longer have the, the belief that you started with. Uh, and to me, that's a kind of a negative epistemic consequence because you've gone from having a, a true belief that you've kind of picked up based on your reading of the various social cues uh, to, to lacking that true belief because you have engaged with all of these challenges. And of course, you know, in real life versions of this example, many of these challengers uh, have not entirely got pure motivations either, right? So it's kind of a all sorts of explanations why um, people have have sprung up to to challenge your interpretation of events. So that's a situation where um, someone has actually uh, kind of had a kind of net epistemic loss from engaging in the sort of debate that that Mill uh, thinks um, is always going to be beneficial. I have here one or two more issues that you also explore in the book and I would like to address here. So another one of the features of our human psychology that is non-ideal, epistemologically speaking, is motivated reasoning. So how would you deal with it uh, according to your framework? Yeah, so it's a, it's a good question. I guess the first thing to say is that, so I said earlier that what non-ideal epistemology means is we have to recognize certain dimensions of non-ideality, so ways in which actual people uh, depart from idealized versions thereof. So one of those dimensions is very much a kind of susceptibility to various sorts of cognitive biases. Um, so kind of ways of misapprehending the world, so to speak. So motivated reasoning, uh, it's not quite a cognitive bias, but kind of roughly speaking, you can call it a, a cognitive bias. So what this refers to is uh, the various ways in which our thinking about the world is motivated by our uh, desire for the world to be a certain way. So human beings are not um, dispassionate inquirers, rather we want certain things to be true, and that can lead us to a uh, kind of constructive view of the world that um, aligns with what we want to be the case. And the important thing to say is that this is meant to happen in various very subtle ways. The idea is not that you kind of simple-mindedly put together this imagined version of the world that fits with what you want the world to be like. Uh, that's not psychologically realistic. Um, rather, what we do is, uh, through various means, we sort of fool ourselves into um, having uh, an understanding of, of things that uh, is amenable to certain purposes that we have. So, and we're all familiar with this, right? So um, how do you go about having a uh, a better impression of your friend's moral qualities than others would have, not by kind of 
deciding to, to think well of your friend regardless of the evidence rather by gathering all the evidence that you need to have a good impression of your friend's moral qualities so when asked uh, about their moral character you will automatically call to mind uh, good examples so that situation where they helped out uh, someone in need as opposed to bad examples that situation where instead of helping out someone in need they went on a fancy holiday for example um you know you can you, you construct the evidence in such a way that you end up with um, the sort of uh, view you want to have. And again, I want to further thing to emphasize is in the psychology on motivated reasoning, um, the idea is that we only do this within certain limits, right? So we can't um, we can't have views of the world that are completely at odds with the facts. Um, so there are certain uh, limits. So for example, if your friend is a truly awful person, the chances are on some level you'll recognize that. Um, so you can only stretch the truth so much, but you can still stretch the truth. So that's motivated reasoning. What implications does that have for epistemology? Well, it makes you ask all sorts of questions about um, not just whether our beliefs are rational or justified, but also how to understand those beliefs in the first place. So why does it raise questions about whether our beliefs are justified? Well, kind of put simply, if it turns out that we kind of gather evidence that is designed to support um, our favorite view of the world, then that doesn't sound like uh, a way of, of forming justified beliefs you know so it's it's not that we kind of go out and gather the evidence and then form the belief rather we kind of in a way almost start with the belief and then go looking for evidence to to support it um so the kind of problem with that of course is that you might think that whatever you started with you'd find the evidence for um so that seems to be kind of a way in which our our beliefs are in a certain sense unjustified and this also, at least to me, makes me ask questions about how we understand beliefs in the first place. So like, we do tend to think that beliefs are the sorts of things that we form in response to evidence, right? So kind of that's what a belief is. Uh, it's, it's a kind of evidence responsive thing. This is the way that a lot of philosophers like to talk. Um, but if the uh, literature on motivated reasoning is to be believed, uh, that's not quite right. Um, beliefs are evidence responsive in the sense I mentioned earlier, that they can't be too at odds with the evidence, but they're not necessarily evidence responsive in the sense that they are formed in response to the evidence. Again, rather, it might be more like we, we go and gather the evidence that we need to support the belief we already have. Um, so yeah, I mean, that to me it indicates that the motivated reasoning has got all sorts of interesting epistemological implications that are, are worth thinking through. And that's what I try to do in the book. And in regards to those implications, do you think that keeping in mind all of what you said there, dealing with motivated reasoning epistemologically necessarily leads to skepticism? Uh, well, first of all, no, but let me just take a step back and say what we mean by skepticism here. Mm -hmm. So yeah. so in philosophy, uh, certainly in epistemology, when we talk about skepticism, usually people assume we're talking about like uh, Descartes skepticism. So the kind of skepticism that says that we, we don't know anything. So the skeptical problem in, in epistemology is usually taken to be uh, what is called the radical skeptical problem, the problem of how to show that we know anything at all. So that's not the sort of skepticism that's the issue here, because uh, there's nothing in the psychological literature on motivated reasoning to support that sort of radical skepticism. Um, so the claim is not, for example, that um, we don't know that uh, the earth is flat, or we don't know that, or I don't know that my hand is in front of me. Um, that's not the sorts of beliefs where motivated reasoning is meant to play much of a role, precisely because these are not these are, these are not the sort of beliefs that are kind of relevant to our um, moral political identities in any obvious way, right? Um, whereas, you know, uh, compare my belief that I've got a hand uh, in front of me with my belief that uh, raising taxes would uh, be a good thing for the UK. Right? This, the second belief is very different to the first, and there's all sorts of ways in which uh, I might um, just go out and uh, assemble evidence to support that belief rather than taking a kind of unbiased view of the situation. None of that applies to my belief that I've got a hand here, right? Kind of, I just, I see it, I believe I've got a hand. Um, so we're not talking about uh, Descartes' kind of skepticism. We're talking about uh, a much more narrowly limited uh, sort of skepticism. It doesn't affect all of our beliefs, but, and this is a crucial point, it affects a lot of the beliefs that are most important to us, right? So, you know, moral, political beliefs, these are the beliefs that really matter. 
Uh, and if it turns out that those are the beliefs where perhaps we are we are less rational than we initially assumed, that would, I think, make for uh, at least a politically uh, or morally interesting kind of scepticism, if not necessarily a kind of purely philosophically interesting form. Um, so your question, though, was, does dealing with motivated reasoning necessarily lead to that sort of scepticism? Mm -hmm. My answer to that is no, it doesn't. Um, I think it really depends on, uh, well, first of all, how you understand motivated reasoning. Uh, and second of all, it's really going to depend on you, right? So what I've said so far is that humans have a tendency to kind of conform their picture of certain parts of the world to what they would like the world uh, to be like. But of course, people vary in terms of this tendency. Um, it could be that some people are less prone to it than others. Um, it could be that even though there is an element of bias in the way in which we go about gathering evidence, um, it's still the case that we kind of gather enough evidence that uh, our beliefs are still justified by any reasonable view of justification. Um, so the point is not that there is this necess necessarily this uh, jump into skepticism. The point is just that it's possible. Um, so there's a kind of skeptical problem that we have to take seriously if we start to think about motivated reasoning. And just going back to radical skepticism for a second, um, so people don't think that radical skepticism is an interesting philosophical problem because it's true. In fact, most philosophers think it's false. Uh, many think it's obviously false. It's an interesting problem because Descartes' skeptical scenarios uh, pose a certain kind of challenge to how we understand uh, our knowledge of the world. Uh, and the idea being we have to answer that challenge in order to be kind of vindicated in thinking we know what we think we know. I want to say the same thing here. Um, this stuff motivated reasoning poses a kind of challenge to whether we have the sorts of political knowledge, for example, that we think we have a rather politically relevant knowledge. Um, that challenge perhaps can be answered. Um, but this is an interesting problem precisely because we have to answer the challenge. Um, so yeah, that's the kind of way in which I'm thinking about skepticism here, not as a necessarily as a conclusion, uh, more as a problem that is worth thinking about. Great. So I think that this is probably a good point to wrap up the interview on. And the book is, again, non-ideal epistemology. I'm leaving a link to it in the description of this interview. And Dr. McKenna, uh, Robin, just before we go, would you like to tell people apart from the book where they can find you and your work on the internet? Uh, well, I assume if you type my name into Google, uh, you'll find me. Uh, I've got a website, uh, robinmckenna.weebly.com. Uh, not a particularly good website. Um, if you look for Robert McKenna, you'll find my University of Liverpool uh, profile. Um, I used to have an active Twitter account, but I've tried to, to leave Twitter behind to, to focus more on more uh, enjoyable things. Uh, but yeah, look for me online. You'll You'll find me. <laughs> Great. So thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show. It's been fun to talk to you. Thanks for the questions, Ricardo. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you liked it, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. And also please consider supporting the show on Patreon or PayPal. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Perurgo Larson, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernard Seixas, Olaf, Alex, Adam Kessel, Matthew Whitting, Bordarno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Philip Forrest Connolly, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegar, Rui Nassi, Zup, Mark Neves, Colin Holbrook, Phil Gavana, Mikkel Stormir, Samuel Andre, Francis Forti, Agnun, Svergor Kossen, Hal Herzog, Nun, Machado, Jonathan Labyrinth, John Nyars, Tantanti, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, John Weyre, Tom Hamel, Sardis, France, David Sloan, Wilson, Yasila, Dez Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Puntara, Dana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavlos Tazewski, Nelek Bak, Madison, Gary G. Alman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Paul Tolentino, John Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litsky, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Lowacki, George Theophanes, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles de Moray, Alex Shaw, Maury Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheists, Larry Dilley Jr., Old Erringbone, 
Asteri, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassi, Igor N, Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Thomas Dovner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Kimberly Johnson, Benjamin Galbert, Jessica Nowicki, Linda Brandon, Nicholas Carlson, Ismael Benzliman, George Coriatis, Valentin Steinman, Per Crowley, Kate Van Goller, Alexander Hubbard, uh, Liam Dunaway, B.R. Masood Ali Mohammadi, Perpendicular, Jonas Hertner, Ursula Goodenough, Gregory Hastings, David Pinsoff, Sean Nelson, Mike Lavigne, and Dios Necht. A special thanks to my producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Tom Van Egdam, Bernard Ignick, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John Carlo Montenegro, Alni Cortez and Nick Golden, and to my executive producers, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano, Bogdan Canivets and Rosie. Thank you for all.